This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Randy Brito, CEO and co-founder of Locha Mesh. Locha Mesh is a mesh network technology that helps one create a network system without having to rely on centralized servers. Doug and Randy discussed Locha Mesh's recent Monero fundraiser and how him and his team are working on trying to make a decentralized network so that it can resist censorship attacks and that will enable secure and private communication and transactions without internet. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Randy. So uh, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me here. Of course. Uh, I know you had you had reached out at one point. I, I wish we had gotten you on earlier when you were actually uh, trying to raise your funds so we could have helped get the word out. I apologize for not getting you on earlier. Um, well, it, only, it of- only took three hours to raise all the funds, so you didn't have time for before the, the, the crowdfunding. Uh, it, really? Okay. Yeah. There was a, a whole a whole process for you guys. That's that's amazing. A whole month. So, how much did you guys end up actually raising? Uh, one hundred fifty uh, moneros, and it's going to be spread out for uh, three different months. Okay. And what what exactly do you plan on doing with those funds? What what are you guys looking to achieve with that? I guess let's let's back up for a second. What 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 is Loka Mesh before we get into uh Okay, it is Locha, Locha Mesh, and it the, the name comes from uh, a currency, a coin from Venezuela in the eighteen hundreds, and it is a mesh network. The mesh network is a technology that lets you create a communication system uh, without having to rely on centralized servers. So currently, uh, communication happens through cell towers and ISPs. But in a, in a mesh network, you have nodes that cooperate with each other to find path to deliver a message. So it is completely peer-to-peer. But in the current implementations that exist, the, it is not decentralized. So Lodge Mesh, what it's trying to do is to take the idea of the mesh networks that have failed in the past and turn it into something that is truly decentralized, censorship resistant, uh, which is resilient enough to support, to, to, to overcome, or to, to circumvent censorship attempts or attacks. So the idea is that there is no central point of failure, but it's all the mesh nodes cooperate with each other to be able to transmit data, enough data, that lets us transmit transactions, messages, and also block data for, to sync your node over a resilient mesh network. That, that is Lodge Mesh. That is the project about. So how does it differ from other mesh networks or other mesh network projects? Well, the mesh networks come from several years ago, like from the 80s and, and, and also all these communications over radio. But what other mesh network uh, projects are trying to do and have been trying to do for the past 10 or 20 years is that they are trying to share internet. So they are trying to share the regular internet that people have in their houses in a mesh network. So if you have internet from your ISP, from your, uh, uh, from your uh, telecommunication company, you then share that with others through a mesh network. So, for example, we have the Giphy uh, or Guifi, which is a, a Spanish project based on the same tech that used the New York Mesh, for example. And they, they basically what do, what they do is that you have a, a fiber gigabyte connection in your house and then you share it with the others 
uh, over a radio and uh, Wi-Fi signal. So it, you, you, you need like a, a high bandwidth antennas that you put on the roof and then you have to uh, beam the internet that you have in your house to others and others connect through it um, like private privately and they can use the bandwidth that you share with them. So you are sharing internet. So you need like high bandwidth to be able to send the current web pages, for example, in 10 years ago, you were able to surf the web with very low bandwidth. So you were able to like read the news and check uh, tweets and things like that. But now for one tweet, you, see, you, you now need like a high bandwidth internet connection in your house. Even a, a simple tweet has so many media and a lot of information and the website takes a lot to to be loaded on the high speed internet in your house. So this mesh network fail because they are trying to share the internet. And in order to be able to share the internet, you need to be capable of sharing Netflix or being uh, being capable of sharing with others websites that uh, wave a lot and, 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 the, and needs a lot of data to be transmitted. What we are trying to do, and, and this is why we are trying to focus this on, is we are going to make a communication network that is for the, the last resort communication system for some people. So there are some people that don't have access to regular internet. They just need to be able to communicate with others privately, securely, in a censorship resistant way. And they don't need to access um, Netflix or download a uh, very wave website that take a lot of bandwidth. So what we're trying to do is to make it enough bandwidth to be able to send Bitcoin transaction, monetary transaction, RPC, uh, fiat theory, uh, RPC pay, uh, calls or, or sync your Bitcoin or, blo or Monero block data over this censorship resistant resilient mesh network. So when we separate this idea of we are not sharing the, your home internet with your neighbors, which is something that needs a stationary antenna with very high bandwidth that usually costs between 800 to eight uh, to eight thousand dollars. We take this idea to the uh, lowest level is what do you actually need to be able to communicate with others privately and securely? And we take that into a um, mobile first device that you can carry around with you that is capable of running for several days on battery or even in solar power. So we create something that you can take with you for to avoid transmitting all the way from the same place. It's not a stationary antenna. So you have you are, have added privacy and secure uh, and security because you are capable of moving around so you cannot be tracked. The, we, are, we are taking all this uh, Bitcoin first uh, idea of making something that actually works instead of trying to be something that we cannot, which is what other mesh networks are trying to do and fail. Mm -hmm. Have any other mesh networks succeeded in, in, in any way? Anything similar to this? I know you're saying the, the large bandwidth ones, but there's nothing else that's kind of more just truly peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, uh, a network, uh, a localized communication network. Has anybody else succeeded with a project like that? We haven't seen any of that in the past two years that we have been researching it. And we ourselves... Uh, a year ago, in January 2019, we had a prototype, which uh, we was our first prototype based on LoRa uh, modulation and uh, with LoRa models uh, using ESP32 LoRa capable devices. And we were ourselves capable of making a, a mesh network that didn't rely on central services. It's like the LoRa one, which is a service. It, is, it needs the servers, servers that run with um, high bandwidth antenna that connect to several other LoRa devices. So we took that idea of the LoRa device itself using LoRa modulation and turned that into Lodge Mesh. So we were able to transmit the uh, map of the network and, and the routes in a, in a decentralized way without having to rely on 
like the first node that talks to the others, like the Bitcoin network right now also do this. It's like it seeds you the first 10 nodes and then it, it start uh, looking for the others, right? So we don't need to do that. So we, we, we don't have to uh, hard code the first node inside the, inside the device. We, we don't have to do that because we, we in, in, in a different way, we, we, we make uh, like a hello world to everyone around. And then we find out what, who is close to us and what the paths are. So other uh, mesh network outside that have been capable of doing that we are trying to do are based on LoRa which is like 10 times less bandwidth than the radio model that we currently use in the second prototype. And most of them were tall like for two, three years, and they only came back to life a year after we completed our first prototype. So some of, some of those lot of base mesh network even use code that we coded a year ago. So they they came back to life some, thanks to the work that the Lochamesh have been doing on the open source community and the open source code. They are now capable of making Lora mesh networks this in a decentralized way. Lora Lora mesh based networks, uh, thanks to the code and the research that we did. But we it's been a year since then, so we after. Uh, some uh, invest, uh, investigation and research, we find out that we need more bandwidth. That's why we are making the second prototype with, with a different radio model. So you're located in Venezuela. Is your whole team in Venezuela? Well, we, the team is currently spread out the world. So we have people in South America, in the US, in Europe. Um, uh, but we are in a... Um, re we work remote and uh, most of our developers are currently being paid by the Bitcoin Venezuela Foundation with the donation that we have received uh, over the past year and also with these grants that we have uh, received in the past through the GitHub repo sponsorship but also through this uh, Monero uh, community crowdfunding system that we have been granted this, all these funds are managed through the Bico Venezuela Foundation. And this, this, this is how we are paying the developers who are working full time. How did you and your team get involved in this? Or who, who actually spearheaded this project, started it? Was it, was it you? And, and what motivated you to do it? Or why did you uh, feel there was a need for, for this? Well, it was in early 2018 in Venezuela, there were some blackouts that the power went out completely in a whole city for an entire week. So it, it was in, in the city of Maracaibo in, in Sulia. And, and there, there was all, all this video that you can find online that the, the power lines were exploding and like a chain of exploding uh, power lines all over the city and the, and the entire city went uh, uh, like a blackout completely. And um, what, what, what happened during that week is that after three days, cell towers also run out of power because they run on, on power generator that needs uh, gas, right? So after three days, even the mobile phone, if you are, if you manage to charge the battery of the mobile phone, the mobile phone doesn't have any service because it's a still rely, uh, relies on cell towers providing them for the uh, signal in order to to then be able to use 3G or LTE and things like that. So uh, in, an, in an entire blackout situation where there is no electricity at all or gas or anything because you are not capable of making trade at all, you, if you are not capable of making bank, bank uh, online banking transfer, for example, how, how do you bring uh, trucks from the center of the, of the country to your side of the country or from the coast so you bring food from the ports or the or the ships, right? So that's the main idea was how do you continue doing commerce when everything is down? When, when, when everything is not working, how do you continue paying others or even communicating with them? That's why I came up with the idea of making 
a censorship resistant, resilient communications network for Bitcoin first. But the main idea is for communications and payments, because if you are not capable of chatting with the guy with the truck or chatting with the people who brings the things to the city and then being able to pay them remotely because they are on the other side of the country, how do you bring food and gas and electricity and things to your to your town, right? So that's the main idea of the Lacha Mesh is how do you pay with Bitcoin when everything um, is not working, when the, there's no electricity communication or anything at all because of censorship or because it, either there is a blackout or because there is a storm or there is a hurricane. That's, it doesn't matter the, the, the reason, but it's, it's that situation where nothing is working. How do you continue making payments and how do you continue communicating with others securely and privately? And that's how we came up with the idea um, in early 2018. That situation then happened in the whole country in the 27 states. Um, so it is like uh, foreseeable that it's going to happen more regularly, more now in this current situation that we are. Mm. And how, how big do you envision this growing? What's kind of your vision with this project? Is it just that it's a niche thing that may be used uh, in a scenario where, uh, you know, internet connections are, are lost in certain areas? Or do you envision this eventually being kind of a, a globally used thing um, where, you know, millions of people around the world are, are using this mesh network as a way to send communications and in particular uh, crypto transactions uh, without relying on internet service providers? Well, the, the idea and what we have been working on is to make it global. So that's one of the reasons that we also discarded other techs that are already existed for mesh networks is that mesh network also has a difficulty, which is as it doesn't rely on a central server on the most of the, of, of the time, it, it needs to keep information on each node enough to be able to deliver the message, right? So it, it basically needs a database on each device with a, a routing tables to know where the message needs to be sent to in order to find a path to get to the, the, the recipient. The recipient. So uh, one of, one of the, the, the difficulties that we found on the current existing uh, tech for mesh is that most of them have a limit of nodes. So once you get out of the city and you want to connect one country to another and you go above the 1,000 or 3,000 nodes, none uh, of the current mesh network technologies can support more than that. So we are making it in a way that we can do it. So we, we are not only capable of connecting one city completely with um, and like the all the population of a city it's with each other through these routes or uh, over the mesh uh, network, but we are also capable of connecting one city to another and being able to 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 uh, provide this communication service for a whole country and connect country with others because we don't have limits on the amount of hops, we don't have limits on the amount of of nodes because we are keeping the information in a decentralized way, in a decentralized way in each node. So we don't have to know all the population of the, of the mesh in order to be able to deliver a message. So our idea is not only to provide local communication server, like uh, services for, for cities, but in order to be, but be able to connect countries to another. Because our idea in the, and the long term is to be able to not only allow people to chat with others privately and securely in a decentralized uh, censorship resistant resilient way, but also be able to transmit Bitcoin transaction and Bitcoin blockchain data and so Monero and also the block data for Monero inside the mesh. So the idea is that Bitcoin users, Bitcoin miners, and also uh, Bitcoin services can run inside, all inside the mesh without having to use the internet at all. So if you have miners connected inside the mesh 
and you have your Bitcoin wallet, your Electron wallet in your phone and you're capable to connect to an Electron server inside the mesh too, you will have everything inside the mesh. You don't need to go to the internet through a gateway anymore. And that's our long-term plan. So you will be able to use Bitcoin as it was meant in the, in the, uh, in the main idea. And it's also a good way to use Monero in a completely private and, and censorship resistant way, because currently to use Bitcoin and Monero, you rely on the internet and your internet is connected to your house and your house is connected to your ID or your phone is connected to your ID your, because you're, uh, now you have to scan your face in order to get a SIM card. So they, they know who you are when you are connected and they more usually know you are using either Monero or Tor or things like that. And they can censor you and they can block you, but they cannot censor a, a decentralized mesh network. They cannot go and censor or, 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 or read each node in every place because we are making them also mobile so you can move around, they can attract you. So this, the long-term idea is that everything will run inside the mesh. It will run on a lower bandwidth than the current internet, but that's mostly for the mobile devices. For the stationary antenna idea that we have, you will be able to transmit way more data and longer distances. But for the regular user that would that have his smartphone, he will be able to carry around the small antenna in order to be able to use and chat and pay with Bitcoin and Monero. So let's let's get into uh, the proposal that you that you posted for funds for Monero um, and kind of where where are you guys actually at now in terms of development? And where are you intending on getting, giving those, given the funds you've received from the Monero community and elsewhere? What's kind of your current status and then your upcoming milestones? Well, we've been working in full time since mid 2018. So this is something that has been paid with uh, through donations, but also through investment on into the hardware company and the, the funds that we are will receive each month with the milestones completed is, is going towards this foundation, uh, the Bitcoin Venezuela Foundation that is paying the full-time developers. But it's also for paying for bounties, for completing things that our developers don't have time to do, but the community can do it. So we are going to pay for those uh, open source uh, help that we're going to get into the code because the code is completely open and free to you, so you can use it um, as far as, as you uh, comply with the Apache version 2 uh, license. So we are currently in close to have an alpha version with the alpha version of the drivers that run on the device, you are capable of building one yourself. So you will be able to, uh, in a couple of weeks or by the end of the month, you will be able to flash one of the compatible devices that we suggest that you can use, uh, which uh, you have the, in the documentation in uh, github.com btcvin slash locha. You will be able to flash one of the compatible devices, the ones that our developers use for develop for development, and you will be able to make a mesh network in your living room with three of these devices already in, in, in about a month. Um, that will that is for advanced users and developers, but the idea is that they have the, the, that they can have the devices running with the code already on their living room so they can understand where we are at right now. So that's on, on the on the software we, we have the drivers almost ready uh, for, to have a, an alpha version and we are going to show a demo within a month um, of, of, of those devices working. And we also have the mobile app, uh, which is the first app that integrates with the Locha Mesh that will enable uh, communications like chats and send images, images and things like that. So you will be able to send from one user to another, for example, one 
uh, offline signet beacon transaction for the other user to find a gateway to send your transaction to the Bitcoin network over the internet. And then what's kind of the, the next milestones after that? After that, we're going to finish the second prototype that we're working on from the hardware company. Um, we're, we think that we'll be able, unless something really bad happens, that, well, something could happen, uh, seeing the, the current situation uh, in the world. But the thing is that we're, we expect to have the uh, design of the devices completed by the end of the year in order to be able to manufacture them and send them to the buyers that have uh, contributed to us through donations. They will get the devices for the donations they've made, but they also will be able to make the purchase, the pre-order the pre in the next few months in order to be able to receive them by the end of the year or, or early 2021. And um, with those devices, that we what we are going to, to enable is that any, any common user will be able to buy this device and out of the box they will work and they will connect to each other in order to deploy the mesh network in any place. So it's, if, if you buy one, uh, a few of them in the pre-order and you receive them by uh, Q1 2021 20, and you um, switch it on in your city and the idea is that it will find others in the same city and start making the mesh in, in your city and find path to deliver messages even through borders or, or, or through gateways or through long range um, stationary antennas that are connected to the lodge mesh. So that's what we are currently working on, on the finishing uh, our second prototype in order to be able to get to a production ready uh, device that we can manufacture, which is also compatible with the compatible devices that we're using for developers. So if you are a developer and you already ha have both those for the alpha in a month, you will be able to use those also in early 2021 to be a node inside the mesh too. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys kind of overcome the, 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 the problem of needing a, you know, a network of people using this? How do, how do you guys intend on on overcoming that, uh, what's what's going to incentivize people to start using it? I mean, if if one person orders the system in that you know uh, this technology and starts using it locally in their in their apartment building, and how how does it get to the point where then you know somebody else uh, you know less than four kilometers away also starts using one, and then somebody else less than four kilometers away from him starts using one? What, what's the incentive to get more and more people to start uh, opting into this network and uh, providing support for this network? One of the things that most mesh network projects in the past have failed is that they don't have any way to incentivize you running the node. So if you don't, know, don't have the node 24-7 20, running, you are not providing others with the service of relaying messages, right? So this is something that we have think, uh, we have thought about since the early days. And uh, we started looking into the Lightning Network as a way to incentivize running the, the nodes. But there are other ways to do it. It's like offering services. It's like if you have an Electron server or you have a, a Bitcoin full node inside the mesh, you can provide other users with the service of getting them the lattice balance or getting them tra their transaction, offline signal beacon transaction into the blockchain. So uh, this is the kind of, of services that we think some people will run uh, their nodes uh, and they will provide the services to others in order to get paid through uh, Bitcoin transactions or Lightning Network transactions for those services. But And then... Uh, a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, the RBC Pay uh, feature on Monero was introduced and this opens a lot of uh, options. It's like you now can run uh, Monero node and provide services to others and get paid with hashes. Hashes from devices that are not connected to the internet. So currently you can run a Monero node uh, and provide other lightweight and wallet with your full node service. 
and get paid uh, with our RPC pay uh, feature. But those users need to be connected to the internet too. And they need to get to you th- over the internet. What if this, if this person is using a Lodge Mesh device to connect to the Lodge Mesh, he most probably doesn't have internet or don't want to use internet because of privacy me- uh, uh, concerns. So this person needs to be able to talk to you who are running a Monero full node to get the latest balance or to get a message relay or get this Bitcoin transaction uh, posted to the Bitcoin network, right? How will he pay to you if he doesn't have the service previously, right? Well, he can. He If, if he has his computer and he has a Lodge Mesh device connected to it, his computer is not connected to the internet, but it's connected to the Lodge Mesh. And your, full, your Monero full node is also connected to the Lodge Mesh. So he can provide you with hashes, with computer power, uh, with and he's going to send to this hashes to you over the large mesh to pay you for you to provide them with a service. This is a way to incentivize you to have your node, uh, which is already 24 seven working, your money or node, but now you are going to get paid for having it also inside the large mesh uh, providing services over the large mesh to other large mesh users who are also in, uh, running this Lodgemans devices. So this is one of the ways we think we are going to be able to provide uh, an incentive of, to having services and also to having your node running all the time inside the mesh so you can help others as a relayer of the messages, uh, as a gateway. If you have both internet and Lodgemans connection, you can work as a, as a gateway to get things from the internet or to the internet. Um, providing services like uh, Lattice blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain data, or or from the blockchain satellite, for example, or messages that come from the blockchain satellite, so you can relay them inside the mesh. This is the kind of service that we think are going to help people understand that they can not only provide a survey, but also get paid for doing it as an incentivization method for having large mesh node working uh, 24-7 for others to relay messages to um, over the large mesh. Hmm. Okay. Um, so you got are you guys crypto people first, and then you got into building these mesh networks, or uh, one thing doesn't necessarily have to do with the other? Uh, what's well, it, it just happens to be both. Uh, but I'm in. I've been into Bitcoin since April 2011. Uh, the co-founder, who is the CTO, uh, Luis, has been in Bitcoin also from the early days as a, a Bitcoin consultant setting up miners for others because he's uh, he understands servers and tech and things like that. So he he didn't have miner himself, but set miner for others. So he understands systems and communications, and and he is also a, a radio um, amateur radio. Provider, so he he has a lot of knowledge on, on that too. It's like the all the Lora prototype he did it himself with all other two developers, um, and they did it from scratch completely. So the, the first prototype from a year ago, and the the one we are making now, they they are very capable of making it a reality as they are showing to the world in on GitHub for those who can read it. Um, so. Uh, we are not only Bitcoin users, but we also believe in the idea of the uh, money uh, for freedom. So we, we the, indeed, the, the name of the project that I came up with is Locha, and it's because of the uh, currency of, of the 1800 in Venezuela, but it's also today, in the nowadays, it means something for people in Venezuela. Uh, Locha means money. And when in, and people has a say in Venezuela that it's uh, when when you ask someone how they are doing, they say I'm luching, I am I estoy luchando por la locha, or they are I'm fighting for my money. It's, it's like when, when you are making your income, then, so people understand that this is something that you have to fight for. So we are lo- we are fighting also for for the money and, and in freedom. So we are uh, luchando por la locha libre. So we are fighting for the free money as in freedom. It's like that's what Bitcoin brings us 
That's an idea, and that's what we are trying to make Bitcoin and Monero to be able to accomplish through a really censorship-resistant uh, private, private first communication method over this mesh network, which is, as, as I said, it's not connected to your ID, is not provided by a company, so you, it's not connected to your identity, it's not, it's, it cannot be censored. And it also cannot be attacked because it's completely decentralized. So that's the how, how the two ideas come. It's like the Bitcoin is money freedom, is, is for freedom. Monero is for privacy, but both currently rely in a highly controlled censorship, uh, capable sens- to censorship is the, uh, the current internet. And that's what we are trying to fix. Awesome. Yeah, I think, you know, the ideals of your project align very well with the Monero project, which I guess is why you were able to receive your funding from the Monero community so quickly. Uh, um, I think there's definitely um, a lot of overlap there between the projects and these ideas you're talking about. Um, I guess let's get into the Bitcoin Monero thing a little bit, because you obviously uh, you've been in the space for a long time. You got it to Bitcoin in 2011. What's kind of your take on Monero versus Bitcoin? What do you, uh, where do you fall there? Well, I can tell you that I've, for the past few years, I've been working for some Bitcoin uh, startups. And I've always been one of those guys who set up the Monero channel on the Slack. So that's, that's me, basically. Uh, like, likely on the current startup I'm working, they also have a Bitcoin uh, channel. So this, uh, it's like we are those guys always, right? The, the ones that uh, always try to put Bitcoin into the conversation, that try to put Monero into the conversation. So why I myself from the very early days started looking into Monero was, was just because I always being into the early days also in Bitcoin. So I understand the flaws that Bitcoin have, but those are flaws that currently are more like trade-off that you have to accept because it is the one that is more spread over, over, over the users and also is more accepted by services. And, and if you have this money and no one accepts it, in this early days, it will happen just like Esperanto, that no one uses it, so it basically dies. So it currently needs to be this way. It's like Bitcoin is more accepted, and it's, that's something that is needed. And if it needs to be more private, uh, we can make it more private. And for those who need privacy today, they can use Monero. So that's what I understood about Monero and when when it was first launched, that I, we need something today, but it doesn't mean that we don't need Bitcoin too. So uh, I think that Bitcoin is important. I think that Bitcoin is very important. I There are things that I don't like about Bitcoin. There are things that I don't like about Monero. So, but I think that I do like about both. So in this, uh, what, what, what we can do and what we are trying to do is, um, I'm not going to discard any of them. I'm going to make them better. I'm going to make them as they should be. It's private and anonymous as they should be for fungibility, but also for our safety. Because when we are using this today, I uh, engaged in a conversation on Twitter a few months ago. And someone said something that, why would I need to record my transaction where I bought this Starbucks uh, drink on a ledger that everyone has a copy of in a censorship resistant way. And, and I basically reply back that, that something that I try not to do anymore, uh, engage on this kind of conversation on the internet, because if they don't understand it, I don't have time to explain it. But the thing is that I, I did engage in that one because I said something. In some places, some people need, not want, they need that coffee. Let's call it coffee. But some people don't, do need it. And in some places, it is illegal to do so. It is illegal for you to buy it. So some people do need a way 
to transact in a decentralized censorship resistant way, even if the trade-off of doing so is that everyone in the world needs to have a copy of it. So this, the important thing that Bitcoin enables and Monero too, is that you are capable of paying others in a censorship resistant way, completely decentralized, that you need, you don't need to trust anyone to do it. And you can do it from your phone or your computer and you don't have to tell anyone to do it and they cannot stop you. That's the important part of it. The trade-off is that you currently have to have, or, and, and most probably in the future you will too, have a copy of it in order to be trustless. But the thing is that in some places, and now with all the things that are happening and with all the policy at stake and the, all the uh, privacy attacking situations that are happening around the world, we do need this censorship resistant way of paying others. And they will find out that they also need it in the future. Yeah, no, I, I obviously totally agree with you. We talk about this on the show all the time. I mean, I go so far as that. That's why I'm more of a Monero guy ultimately than a Bitcoin guy, because I, 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 I agree. I think that is the value proposition of what cryptocurrency is. That's what the, the true utility that it offers is this ability to send transactions peer to peer, uh, without censorship, um, or, you know, uh, without your funds potentially being seized by somebody. Um, and, you know, without relying on any third parties. And, uh, I feel like, but Bitcoin has, hasn't necessarily stuck to those ideals. Otherwise, they would have already um, implemented things like confidential transactions to uh, make the transactions uh, more private uh, and essentially uh, start to add more fungibility to the protocol. Uh, so they seem to say, you know, I, I feel like there's some hypocrisy there. A lot of Bitcoiners say, yeah, you know, it's all about censorship resistance. Uh, but then you see that when it comes to decisions like adding confidential transactions or doing whatever it takes to make Bitcoin uh, more fungible, they come up with reasons as to why that's not necessary. Do you have any opinion there? Well, I haven't yet read anyone saying that is not necessary. Uh, they may reject some people trying to add this features to Bitcoin today. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not going to be added in the future. The thing is that the current team have some ways to do the things. Um, the thing is that no other team have been capable of catching up with them. So uh, like the Lib Bitcoin team, for example, they tried to do that, but they basically vanished. So the thing is that if you want to do something, you just do it. You, do, you don't jail at others because they don't want to do it for you. The thing is that the, that's how I see it um, on that way. But the thing is, I, I do see some things getting better on Bitcoin for privacy. There are some things that obviously see like they are trying to make it worse, but there are a lot of things and there are a lot of people working on making it better. And one of the things, for example, is if you are not capable of adding in the code right now because it is more conservative, uh, some things that haven't been tried enough or or that will break something so you will need to go over uh, emergency uh, situations so this is kind of thing they might want to stop uh, or avoid um, there are something that cannot be touched in bitcoin it's like things like uh, the number of uh, of coins that there exist if you add uh, complete privacy they will be difficult or more difficult to to see if there haven't any new coins being minted without anyone knowing, things like that. So they, they are more conservative, conservative in that way. But if you want to make Bitcoin more fungible and more private and more censorship system, you may be adding those new features and untested features in the future when they have been tried, tested and, and all this stuff. But for the time being, you can also make Bitcoin more private by, for example, not having to link your transaction to an IP address that is linked to your ID. So you will be able to make the Bitcoin transaction that you want to do completely anonymously. And, 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 and in the future, you, in the near future, you will be able to do all Bitcoin transactions and all Bitcoin functions 
in a completely private and censorship resistant way over the launch of Mesh. The thing is that not all the features can be added to the main Bitcoin core, that core product that exists, just because no one else has been capable of making uh, a software that it's capable of catch up with it enough, with, with enough user and enough acceptable uh, number of users that can overcome the other one. But that's something that it can be changed. Maybe the Lacha Mesh team can do it. We, we, we have core pro project, uh, core Bitcoin core developers inside our, well, well Bitcoin Lightning core developers inside our, our team. So we might be in the future if we have enough support from other teams like the, the Monero community, for example, to make that Bitcoin privacy feature uh, to be accepted by the users. While, uh, or thanks that we are putting into their heads right now that privacy and censorship resistance is important over the large mesh, they will understand that it's also important for Bitcoin core developers, um, and the Bitcoin core software, I mean, not Bitcoin core with a capital C, but the Bitcoin core software itself, that it's going to be needed too. Um, this is something that the user needs to accept because the Bitcoin's users are the ones that decide what software they are running on their computers, not the developers, what code they put inside the, the, the software but the user who are running it. So the, may the, maybe the users is currently don't understand the importance of this to be to, to accept that they need either to vote by going to Monero or vote by going to a different software that runs the features that they want. But this is something they will understand in the future when everything started um, going worse that it's currently happening. And, and you can see it with all these tracking services and devices that, that the government are currently putting in place with these temporary measures for, for the COVID-19. And they are now going to make it permanent to track everyone, where they are going, who they have met with and all the stuff. So people will understand this. It will take a lot of time. I, I'm Venezuela. I understand this. It's just, I, I, I always say, why if people wants to use Bitcoin, they don't do it privately. So, uh, and, and so they, they use Bitcoin and don't use Monero. And I say, well, why if people wants to be free? They are still in the in this in the situation they are in Venezuela. So it's I I have lived this in 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 my flesh myself. So I understand it a little bit more for for, for the Bitcoin community to not understand it yet. Yeah, wait. I, I think I may I may have not picked up what you said for one second because what yeah why aren't we seeing more people in Venezuela using Monero versus Bitcoin? If the kind of the one of the real use cases there. Uh, is to use it without government intervention, right? Um, wouldn't wouldn't people feel safer using something like Monero versus Bitcoin? Yeah, that's that. What I was trying to to say is that people don't understand it, so people may need to understand it first in order to be able to use it. So the thing is that they they don't think they need this kind of tools. So I've been uh, since twenty twelve trying to educate people about this in Venezuela and also in Spain and Chile. But the thing is that it is kind of difficult to make people to understand things that they haven't yet lived through. So it is difficult for some people, for example, in the U.S. to understand what inflation is or hyperinflation is. They may be able to understand it in a couple of years now that there are several trillions of millions of dollars being printed. Now they will be able to understand what inflation is. But the thing is that if, if this situation didn't happen, may they ever in the future in their life understand what inflation is if they never live through it? That's the kind of things that, for example, in Venezuela, why people are not using big? Be just because they don't understand it. They don't think they need it. They don't understand the basics. In, in the same way, and, and, and this is more what is actually happening in Venezuela. People don't even understand freedom. People don't know they need it. People don't know they want it. It's like most of the people in Venezuela actually believe in the things that have been put in place in the country in the past 20 years. So it, that's not understandable. So the same way it's like why people don't use Monero instead of Bitcoin. Because that it is already very difficult for them to understand why they need Bitcoin. Most of them don't even use Bitcoin at all. They use Bitcoin in some, in some uh, 
number in a database of some exchange. They don't even use Bitcoin. The real Bitcoin is themselves. Most of them don't even run uh, a wallet, uh, a non-custodial wallet. They usually use a, a third-party service, a custodial wallet. So the thing is that people, we, we might think that there are users inside Bitcoin and Monero who understand a lot of things, and they don't. Yeah, I, I've seen users using Monero uh, from free free wallets, things like that, or or, or using Monero uh, inside Kraken, and they think they are using Monero. Well, what, 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 you are not using Monero inside Kraken. It, it, it does. It, you, you shouldn't be buying the things you think you can buy with Monero if you bought them on Kraken. It doesn't make any sense. So it, that just tell us that people not only on the people yet don't understand what they are actually using or what the actual use or or, or, or the meat or for all this uh, to exist and um, just yet they don't get it yet so this is something that we have to still work on which is an education on the basics and um, what we are actually trying to accomplish which is not paying for coffee basically not only paying for coffee i mean <laughs> or, or unfortunately, they might learn from certain events that happen you know they might they might not only they may not learn it until some event happens where they realize wait yeah, a minute so some people, people can only learn from their own experiences hopefully so they learn from it. right do you ultimately think Monero is more censorship resistant and unconfiscatable than Bitcoin? I'm not capable of saying so. Like technically, if if I would, if I was able, if I were able to do it, if I were able to read the entire Bitcoin code and read the entire Monero code and understand it, I may be able to say that. But as I'm only capable of understanding part of it enough for me to trust what I'm using, I'm not capable of saying if it's more unconfiscatable than the other, um, but I know that I can make it more difficult to be confis confiscated. It's like mm, if I unlink myself from what I'm using and people are not capable of link my identity to that, they won't be able to confiscate it like with a wrench uh, attack, right? So that's the kind of thing that I can provide I cannot do it from the other more code, uh, understandable of the things, but I can do it to um, from this uh, from the things that I do understand. I gotcha. Okay. Um, so when do you think? Uh, la last question. Uh, when when do you think we'll actually? Uh, this is you know this is a tough one. Uh, but when do you think we'll get to the point where we'll see? A Monero transaction taking place uh, through the Loka Mesh. I, I, am I pronouncing it right? How do you yeah. say it's Loka Mesh? It's, it's, it's Locha. Locha. Locha Mesh. Yeah, it's like Locha. Or something like that. Locha Mesh. Yeah. Um, well, I think we can have the in by the end of the month we can have uh, even a Monero transaction of the Lodge Mesh. The thing is that the Lodge Mesh currently will be a living room with three devices inside of it. It's not completely deploy deployed anywhere. Uh, but we are going to work on that. We are going to work to on, on getting uh, the community and, and some ambassadors and some people uh, to run them on the big city so you will be able to connect to them once you have yours too. But we might be able to make a Monero transaction or our RPC, RPC pay uh, call or something like that inside uh, with the launch mesh within in a month. Uh, we are going to report back now to um, the Monero community for the past month work. And we hope that they are happy with the things that we have been working on uh, so hard this past month and in order to be able to complete the milestones. Uh, so we can continue doing this every month. And if they want to help us after the three months a grant that they have provided to us, or if they want to join, and um, now that we are going to have the alpha and, and the documentation ready, if they want to join us on the job to make this real, uh, we are thankful for everything they do and they have done for us. But we are also welcome them on helping us on the code, on the test, 
on the uh, ambassador or, or anything they can help us to get this into reality because we need it. Awesome. Yeah, like I said, I, I you know, I, I do think these projects really do overlap in terms of their ideals and uh, I'm excited to see you moving, you know, moving ahead with it. And I'm excited to see that you got the funding from the Monero community. I wish you lots of luck um, and maybe you can come back on the show at some point to give us an update as you as you move forward. Um, and so I guess final thing, where can people who are just learning about this project now, where can they follow it more closely and learn more about it? Well, you can follow us on Twitter on Locha.io, um, Locha um, underscore IO. And on Telegram is also Locha underscore IO. And on GitHub, where you can contribute to the code and check out the documentation we are working on. We need to translate it into English. That's what we are currently doing. Uh, it is github.com slash btcvin slash locha. All right. Randy, thanks. Really appreciate it. Best of luck. Uh, yeah, man. Great job. Thank you. Anything want to bring up? Sorry? Is there anything else you would like to bring up? Oh, come join us on La Lucha por la Locha Libre. And the fight for the freedom of the lacha. <laughs> awesome, man. Good luck. Thank Thanks you. for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.